I come to MIT uh, with a background primarily in renewable energy. Um, I helped build uh, the world's first uh, hydrogen fuel cell bus fleet. Um, I then went on to uh, lead a team that installed the world's first um, completely automated uh, hydrogen fueling station for automobiles. I spent most of the last five years um, developing grid-scale electric energy storage systems, um, leading engineering and commercial teams both in North America and in China. Uh, here at MIT, I chair the SDM Industrial Relations Committee. Um, the committee's mission is to deepen the relationship between SDM fellows uh, and, and industry. Um, the IRC facilitates a wide range of interactions between industry and the, uh, the SDM fellows uh, through internships, research projects, theses, and uh, ultimately job placements. Um, while research projects and job placements are obviously longer term things, um, we do the shorter term projects tend to generate immediate impactful results for our partner companies. Um, if you're interested in learning how you can get involved, please see me after this talk. So with my shameless plug out of the way, um, as we get towards the end of the afternoon, we are in for a real treat. Uh, Joseph Coughlin is the founder and director of the MIT Age Lab, which resides within MIT's engineering systems division. Age Lab is the first multidisciplinary research program created to understand the behavior of the 45 plus population, the role of technology in that behavior, and the opportunity for innovations to improve the quality of life of older adults and their families. In 2008, the Wall Street Journal called Dr. Coughlin a pioneer in inventing the future of retirement and aging. In 2009, Fast Company called him one of the 100 most creative people in business. Dr. Coughlin will be talking to us today about prognostic aging, envisioning a systems approach to well-being across the lifespan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph Coughlin. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon. Oh, come on, you had your coffee. Good afternoon. Thank you for staying and not running to the airport right away. I really appreciate that. No. Um, thank you, Matt, for the, for the introduction as well. Yeah, I, I know it's kind of hard to end the day on an aging note, but it, it'll, it'll go down, and then we'll bring you back up with something to look forward to. Um, I'm going to invite you not to listen to me uh, do death by PowerPoint, but I'm going to invite you to help me think through um, some uh, things that I've been putting together in my head, and this is actually putting it down on PowerPoint. The next step, uh, if uh, you don't laugh too hard, is to put it down on paper. And, and that is thinking about longevity as a system, or aging as a system. Not in the classic sense that SDM thinks about, or those of us in engineering systems in general think about, in that, that we have this underlying assumption that we design a system that systems are designed, we put the pieces in place, that we think about the, the general equilibrium of the system, we think of feedback. Well, that's true for most of the topics that we've had at the conference, as well as most of the, uh, the systems that we tend to study. What I want to ask and what I want to try to show you are bits and pieces of what I think is an emergent system, where there's lots of engineering going on, there's lots of social behavior going on, but together, these things are coming together in a very strange way that are creating a system, a longevity system, around health, wellness, and indeed well-being. And basically, as we get to questions, and frankly, if you have a question during my talk, that's fine too, but I'd also like to hear whether you think I'm all wet or there's actually something here, so to speak, in terms of what the things that I see emerging around not just older age, but how we're looking at healthcare management, healthcare innovation, and how that's going to impact longevity, and probably more importantly, impact how we all live tomorrow. So I uh, love this cover slide because it makes sure that someone else has the same haircut I do. Uh, from the looks of the audience, I see a number of you go to the same barber shop, so that's, <laughs> we're good on that. So with that uh, intro I gave you, I do have to give you a warning that only part of this is true. Here's what's the part that is true. Everything I will show you in the individual elements and subsystems are either on the market or in the laboratory ready to go to market very soon, whether it's my lab, someone else here at MIT, or around the world. The question that I'm going to ask you to think about as I go through and kind of weave this uh, somewhere between science and science fiction story is that together does it create an emergent system around longevity and well-being? Well, we all have heard that this healthcare thing seems to be an issue, right? 
um, the cost structures around healthcare. This is a very nice way to visualize the data. These are essentially where the costs are in healthcare. So if you look at the darker blue down at the bottom, that's hospital care, the red above that, the next big chunk, physician and clinical services. And then we start getting into, shall we say, more of the noise. Yep, prescription drugs, nursing home care is growing. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then we start getting into administrative, cost of uh, health, uh, research, public health equipment. One of the things I would like to suggest, and I'm one of the guilty parties in this in, in research, is that as we have been thinking about healthcare systems innovation, are we working on the margins? We are using very interesting techniques from lean production and lean manufacturing to squeeze out efficiencies in the OR, to squeeze out efficiencies in surgery, to better measure the cost impact of how we process patients or how we operate a hospital or how we do intake or the uh, either ubiquitous or shall we say still ambiguous notion of electronic medical record. These are all going to save us, we think. And yet when I look at these costs, I see a lot of it may be buried in that blue, but what I see there is a lot of it being buried in disease and treatment of disease, not necessarily on the operation of the system. And so as we think about aging and well-being, I started thinking with a discussion I had with John uh, Grace some uh, months ago about something that I had forgotten that I had actually started my career on, which was this is the really exciting stuff that one starts their, their career after they get their master's before their PhD doing reliability engineering on ASR9 FAA weather radar. Exciting stuff. Bury with statistics for months at a time to figure out mean time between failure, mean time, mean time between reliability, and to show my own old age. In those days, FAA was not even sure where all the radar were that we were measuring for reliability. So the idea of prognostic engineering, essentially, can we predict when the system's going to break can we predict when the system is going to misbehave? And frankly, can we predict performance overall? And so we're very fond of doing this with our cars. We uh, have times when we're supposed to bring it in for the oil change. We now, I notice, get phone calls from our dealers or emails from our dealers to bring it in. Uh, our TV sets uh, have gotten so reliable that we throw them out now when they're no longer reliable or maybe a few of us still get them fixed. Uh, reliability in an aircraft is usually a good thing, particularly at 36,000 feet. Uh, nuclear uh, uh, power and nuclear weapons. I came from eg and years ago. That was kind of our business. We were very interested, shall we say, in reliability. And of course, things in dishwashers and home appliances and the like. It's interesting. All these things are very expensive. Many of these things have high impact if they go wrong. But we really don't have a concerted system as elaborate as this one to think about humans. You know, this is the classic prognostic engineering approach. We collect data, we think about failure modes, we look at failure mechanisms, what's going to happen, what's that life cycle profile. We are really good as systems engineers getting into the detail of what little last thing is going to happen with a piece of software or a piece of equipment. And aging has benefited. Aging is a system success. Uh, class participation, does anyone have a guess as to uh, what life expectancy was 100 years ago? 45, between 45 and 50, about 47 actually in the United States, 46, 47 years. 100 years later, life expectancy now, some would argue, is well into the 70s. I would suggest it's actually higher than that, and the actuarial tables have not caught up to it. The fastest growing part of the aging population is actually 85 plus. Now we could say that we've done a really good job of getting people to live longer, or what this suggests is that the next time you see a civil engineer, you should go out and give them a hug. Because clean water, yes, and vaccinations, and to a certain degree, healthcare deliveries help people live longer. But that system around nutrition, clean air, clean water, and clean living has actually enabled people to, get, uh, to live longer, and in many cases, better. So if you can get a kid to live between zero and five years, chances are they will live much longer. So there's a system success. But here's my question for you, is this came out exactly almost one year, almost to the week of our conference here. In the industrialized world, they're suggesting that 50, this is the Lancet, 50% of the babies being born in the industrialized world are likely to live to 100. Think about that. That changes a lot of things. We see protests around the world about retirement at age 60. Can you imagine living to 100? And that means, and I, and I have a teenager, I can assure you these data are accurate. From zero to 20, they're, 
not productive and adding nothing to the economy. <laughs> and then from 60 to 100, you're essentially adding nothing to the economy. So that would essentially be 60 years where you're offline. I mean, just think of the things that would change um, if we live that long. And even if we only lived to 85, that's actually 45 years offline compared to how many years you'll actually be working. So longevity changes everything. But if we are going to be living this long, do you guys want to live long if you're in a nursing home? Or if you're really sick or can't function? Or as Sarah Noss, who lived to 121, said, if you don't have your health and you can't do things, do you really want to live that long? And what we're seeing around the world is that people, are, in fact, are living much longer, that aging, in fact, is not just a United States or European phenomenon. China is actually the oldest nation in the world in terms of the number of people over age 65. Japan is, is exploding with an aging population where by mid-century their population will reduce by 20 to 30 million people and roughly 30% of the population that's left will be over age 65. But here's the system I want you to think about. We can estimate mean time between failure for our dishwashers, our radars, our planes, but we haven't really thought about the longevity or well-being as a system to be managed. If, in fact, this child is going to live 100 years, I would hope that he or she lives a long, well life, but also, just being somewhat selfish, I would hope that that child does not live a life that is going to cost the rest of us in terms of health care. So how can we look at this system, this individual, as a system that needs to be monitored, managed, perhaps motivated, to look at health in terms of managing that cost. Because if we go back to what those health care costs look like, at the end of the day, is it really how efficient we can get people in and out of the hospital that's going to save money? Is it really going to be how much data I can collect on you alone so that I can have an electric medical, uh, electronic medical record that is going to save money? Or some little quiet secret we don't like to talk about, is it going to be about how you behave? how well you are. What's your proclivity to a certain disease and how well did you try to manage it ahead of time before it not only costs you and your family, but costs the rest of us? So what is the life cycle strategy that we should use for this really cute kid? No, it's not my kid. I just found it on the web. Um, let me give you some good news and some bad news. The good news is you will be living longer. That's the great news. And in fact, even some of the better news is, is that disability rates in the industrialized world, particularly in the United States and Northern Europe, appear to be either static or some of the better data suggests that disability rates are on the decline. That's the good news. Bad news? At least 110 million of us in the United States alone have one chronic disease. Asthma, diabetes, hypertension, whatever it might be. 60 million have at least two and 20 million of us pulled a lottery to winning lottery ticket for five chronic diseases. Now, for the rest of the world that's looking at the United States saying fat nation, uh, I might add the following pieces of data. First off, the UK snacks more and eats more candy and junk food than the Americans per capita. And my wife's family from Greece, the Mediterranean diet is on its deathbed. Lifestyle and globalization are now making pizza, hamburgers, and fast food the next best thing to souvlaki, olive oil, and olives themselves. So what we're seeing is a change in lifestyle and change of living, not just uh, 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 regional choice. So here's the challenge. You are very likely to be ill. The challenge is going to be, will you be so sick that you're taken out of the game not to be able to do the things you want to do over a 100-year span? This is the really depressing data, and I promise it'll get better after this. Uh, I work with Gallup, uh, uh, the survey folks, and we are doing 1,000 surveys per day for 25 years. That's one mother of a data set. And we're looking at well-being over time in the United States, and we'll be doing it internationally soon. But what we're looking at is the following. Uh, the, Gallup, uh, the, the Gallup Healthways uh, Well-Being Index, as it's referred to, looks at emotional health, physical health, economic health, access to health care, and also an assessment, self-assessment of how was your day yesterday and how well do you think it's going to be tomorrow. These data show, whoop, did I hit it? Hit the wrong one. There we go. These data show relative well-being by age cohort. 
So if you notice, despite the fact that they tend to be a little bit loud about how they feel, 18 and 21 year olds are in pretty good shape in terms of their overall well-being. Then it kind of dips a little bit. That first job kind of takes a hit out of you, as most of us can uh, attest to. <laughs> and then it kind of gets OK for a while. By the way, if you notice, women, until their husbands get sick and are in the caregiving mode, tend to do far better than men over time in general. Um, but for those of us who are in middle age, or shall we say deep middle age, uh, 37 to 57, it's all downhill from here. It's interesting if you think about this because the disease, rate, the disease rates, depression rates, and treatment for disease are mostly amongst the elderly, but it's the middle-aged folks that actually report lower states of well-being. As a result, not only are they uh, experiencing pain, fatigue, and stress, but they are the most difficult to engage because they are so busy, so, and these are the factors that are leading to this low state of well, uh, well-being, so worried, stressed, angry, and sad that it's very difficult to engage them to eat right, exercise, or to do all the things that we know could save them quality of life as well as, uh, as money. So if we look at the population over age, by age by who's spending money, this is where what, how old is old becomes very questionable. As we said, if we can keep a child uh, doing well between zero to 10, that's pretty good. Then we're relatively cheap. But if you notice, starting at about age 43, when we start to, uh, our genetic makeup and bad habits start picking up and, and catching up to us. So pre-hypertension, pre-diabetes. And so now you start seeing that aging or disease-related aging really becomes an issue in your 40s. So the question I would have as a system is to look at this as this is the cost. These are the data that we're trying to manage the performance of. Where do we intervene? Most of the healthcare systems innovation discussions we're having right now are looking at interventions of folks once they are in the system. Once they're in the system, they're already a cost factor. So what I'd like to suggest is that we should start thinking about longevity and well-being as a system much earlier on, either certainly in childhood, but at the very least, we should try to engage these folks that are in middle age. So if we look at who's costing the money once they're in the system, this is Alliance, uh, Allianz insurance data. You can see by the red, this is the, most, the oldest population. In fact, the data are somewhat arguing uh, around the world that apparently 50% or better of all the health care costs you will ever incur are in the last six months of life. Some argue it's even as high as 70%, but let's just basically say it's very high. So I would like to try to do is to manage not only how much that's going to cost, but if we can keep you out of the hospital or out of the system for as long as possible. This came out today, so you got it very fresh. Look at this. One third of USA adults could have diabetes by 2050. If you read this article later on, you'll note that it's being driven largely by the aging population. And the reason why I'm picking diabetes is that particularly amongst the baby boomers, that group born between 1946 and 64, this is, shall we say, the disease of choice uh, of baby boomers that converges with cardiovascular blood pressure to form what's known as metabolic X. This is the cost driver, not only in the hospitals and, and healthcare system, but it's also the thing that makes complications very difficult, makes it very difficult to manage other diseases, have surgery, and the like. So this is a major cost driver. And it's not, ju not just the United States that's looking at this. We're looking at diabetes exploding in India, Russia, Europe, South America, particularly the, the BRIC countries in general. Think of this. The baby boomers in the United States are turning roughly 64, one every seven seconds. Worldwide, though, every six sec every, uh, every, there are six deaths every minute due to diabetes. So this, this is not just a disease per se. This is also a disease that brings with it other diseases such as kidney failure, blindness, heart attack, and the like. But here's the biggest reason why I think diabetes is interesting and why an emergent system around healthcare innovation may be interesting if we take a reliability approach to it, so to speak. It's amenable, at least type two is, amenable to behavior. It is amenable to lifestyle choices of what you eat, exercise, seeking of information, and we are now seeing an explosion of technologies available to help you monitor, manage, and motivate behavior around diabetes. So this is one of these diseases that's very expensive. It is terrible to, to manage, but we also know how we can actually manage it. So this seems like it would be the ideal problem set for an engineer. Here's your problem set. 
Can you manage lifestyle? Can you get people exercise? Have a salad once in a while? And we'll give you the devices to do so. This sounds like it should be a doable thing. Any arguments? You're all game. OK. You're all in. That's what I wanted. So let's go back to the baby. Let's design, as good systems engineers, a system to keep this child from charging you later on from being a diabetic, and also to ensure that he or she has a really good life. I don't know how my wife does it. She can always tell whether it's a boy baby or a girl baby. If there's no colors, I can't tell. So I'm going to give you some things that we go back to when we were looking at the radars and the dishwashers and the planes that we want as good systems engineers and systems analysts the following. I think that a good longevity well-being system should give us good predictive data. We want some good, rich data on what this kid and what their lifestyle is going to be. We also want some, some information in terms of what they do on a daily basis. How can we actually manage that in such a way so that we might be able to maybe modify those behavior patterns, that eating habits that we were talking about, exercise. And we don't want to do it by ourselves. You know, the joke about the baby boomers in particular is that we don't like to be alone in our own thoughts. Well, Nicholas Christakis over at Harvard's got done great work with James Fowler and others talking about the importance of social networks to reinforce health behaviors. Smokers with smokers, obese people with obese people. So we're going to get you some social support to make sure that you manage that diabetes so you're not by yourself. Personalized care. It's all going to be about you. We're going to be using a number of ways to do that. And then we're going to monitor. We're going to give you what's a good system. It's got to have a feedback loop, right? It's got to come back into the system so that we've got some equilibrium there to be able to manage how this child is doing for 100 years. So I've got a solution looking for a problem, and I'll call that solution technology. So I've got implantable sensors. In this case, this is a blood pressure sensor. The spoon here that was invented here on campus is the bane of my existence if it ever gets uh, in my kitchen. It, it will measure the viscosity, the fat, and the sugar level within a, uh, shall we say, Ghirardelli brownie mix, and then upload that information to the internet. And I'm not really worried about the doctor, but if my wife gets all the fact that I'm hitting this Ghirardelli brownie box again, I could be in trouble. Pervasive health whether it's your iPod, whether it's your cell phone, whatever it might be. The idea of this particular system developed at Berkeley has everything from glucose monitoring in it to EKG to EPG and the like, and you can bring it up to the internet and share it with whatever group that you like. Personalized medicine. You know, it's very interesting. When we talk about healthcare, we talk in terms of populations. That's because of our epidemiological cousins that, so shall we say, an economist that own healthcare. But the trend of technology and the trend of medication is going to personalization, so genetic makeup. And yes, there are always wearable computing. Unfortunately, in this case, the example I'm giving you is wearable underwear that also has sensors in it. And we can save, you can use your imagination as to what you might be able to sense uh, with wearable underwear. And the fellow up there from Georgia Tech who's got a shirt that can monitor you anywhere on the planet within five meters of accuracy. We'll come back to the question later on, do you want me to? All right, so let's build this system out. Let, let's, let's really make sure that this child not only has a good life, but a healthy life and an engaged life, and for our selfish reasons, a cheap life. Predictive data. Do you know that already on the market today, you can test for 60,000 diseases. My wife and I had a child 17 years ago and one seven years ago. Yeah, things happen. The difference between the counseling 17 years ago and 10 years later was incredible. We were still the same people. We were still married at that point 20 some years, but the amount of genetic testing that can be done, and certainly is done often with a, some, what they call older mother, is, in, is incredible. But already on the market today, and being done by many hospitals, is up to 60,000 tests for prenatal diseases. The price point, if, you don't, if the hospital doesn't need to do it or doesn't want to do it, for you to do it, can be about a $1,000 range. And it does not have to be amniocentesis. It can be blood or urine. So I guess I'm putting this up now for, of the mother before the baby's born, is I now have the ability to go back to that cute baby and say, you know, you got to choose your parents better next time. You've got this one over here with a high blood pressure problem, and she's got diabetes going back to her great-great-grandfather. So you've got these certain proclivities in this area. So we can basically blame your parents for about 25 to 30 percent of whatever disease or bad factors or even good factors that you have. So is this just the science? No. Let's go on the web already, and I'm not pumping any company in particular. I just pulled one off the web. That was a good example. This is for babies and adults. 
decodeme.com, I believe it's called. And this one, as you can see the price, $2,000. So we'll check for cardiovascular disease, likelihood of heart attack, neurological conditions, Alzheimer's disease. I can give you enough information to make you paranoid for the rest of your life if you want. <laughs> so why would we want that information? Well, first for the baby. Keep in mind, we're doing this, this emergent system. So we're gonna know about the baby even before it's born. But now let's think about, as we get older, who's in charge of our health? And if you ask people that are baby boomers, those 46 and older, the next generation behind them, the X generation, the echo boomers, 70, look at this, it's very consistent. I am directly responsible for my health. Well over three quarters of the population, regardless of age group, believes that they are. And interestingly enough, Health professionals keep me healthy. Boy, for all the interest in health care and our doctors, it appears that we believe that we are in charge. Not that we're doing much about it, but we believe that we're in charge with it. So, WISP be in charge. Let's, now that baby has grown up, let's give them tools, if you will, to be able to manage their and monitor their well-being overall. MyFoodPhone.com uh, started in Canada. It is now south of the border here uh, via Sprint. Allows you to take a photograph of your meal and upload it to get an assessment of the quantity and the quality of what you've been eating. So in my case, the brownies, the carrot cake, and you can see I've got a little bit of a sweet tooth. Um, is out there an ability to monitor and, and keep that information in such a way so that we can actually see what you've been doing and eating. The device you see on the right is a device we developed in my lab, which is a personal shopping advisor that will be on your cell phone rather than on the shopping cart itself. But this technology allows you to use, for now, the barcode RFID tomorrow in terms of going through, taking your personalized diet, and allows you to, say, pick up a cracker box, swipe your, uh, your system underneath it, and it'll say, gee, Joe, you chose your dad badly, you're pre-hypertensive, try something with lower sodium, move on to the next cracker that's something else. But the bottom line is, part of our system we're engineering here is I am giving you the information necessary for daily health solutions. Perfectly rational system. We're wearing our system hat. I've gotten the predictive data, and now that I know what your proclivity is going to be to a certain disease category or not, I'm going to give you the, the information to act upon it. I don't see much excitement out, out there about this, this lifestyle. This is on the market. You know, we're not much for devices, but we do love our TVs. So this is developed by Philips. It's called Motiva. And it'll, it'll remind you to take your medications. It'll uh, facilitate a video conferencing in the next generation between, say, a cardiologist, specialist, nurse. The bottom line is you could have your own personal health channel on your cable set-top box to aggregate programming across the bandwidth that is about what your disease or what your uh, possible disease would be and remind you to do all the behaviors, whether it's exercise, take your medications, check your blood sugar, weigh yourself, and upload those data to a different source. So not only have I engaged you in the grocery store, I am now engaging you in between the football game, in between the soaps, or in between whatever you might be watching at night. And we don't want to do this alone, do we? We need social support. We have to do it with our friends. And friends now are gotten a lot further away and stranger than they used to be. So let's look at this. Social support and agents of change. So the argument that goes in the social network literature, particularly around health, is that you can give a message to a person and they'll listen to it, but they want to validate the, the, uh, the message by talking to other people they trust. Does anyone want to, want to take a guess as to what the most trusted person in the United States is right now? Oprah. Oprah? No. It's other people like you. So you go on the web, and if you're a geek as I am and live on CNET before you get up in the morning, you check CNET or something like that. You go on and you try to find somebody else who's either as much a technophile or a technophobe as you may be to say, okay, their estimate of what this piece of equipment can do is X. In healthcare, we're finding the number one search going on in healthcare right now are other people doing research looking not for doctors, not for mayoclinic.com, but for other caregivers or patients like themselves to get information what that might be. So myhealthexperience.com, and these are in the UK and other places are using this. Uh, Daily Challenge, has anyone seen this system? There are a number of them like this, but Daily Challenge, this is an example. It sends you a Facebook or an email message to give you a daily challenge towards well-being. In this case, take three slow, deep breaths. Another one might be take the stairs. So I've got information about your history. I'm prompting you in the store. I'm watching you watch TV. And now I'm going to buzz your belt, your purse, or your computer 
to make sure that you stay on, shall we say, that healthy line. But what's another incentive? What's, what's a way that we can get people to do what they should do? How do, how do you motivate people? There's got to be somebody here who took out Management 101. Money, okay. You're not a sociologist. You're an economist. What's another way? Recognition. You know, there's another one. Money and fear. Remember what I said. I'm talking about the possibility of an emergent system where everything I'm pointing to already exists. The question is, is it coming together? Does anyone remember this case? This guy worked for Scott's. And Scott's, the, uh, uh, the garden uh, landscape as well as fertilizer company, has a very definitive policy. No smoking. Well, okay. No smoking in the truck. No smoking on the job. No smoking in the office. He was smoking at home. And they fired him. And it was held up in court. This is not just the US. This happened in the UK as well with the National Postal Service. So here's another agent of change. It's not just your friends or your virtual friends, but can we now envision employers who even in the future years may get off the hook in paying your health insurance, have a vested interest on your absenteeism, presenteeism, and productivity in the workplace enough to say, you know something, Joe? We've been looking about how you've been gaining weight and the hair thing, we let that go. But how you've been gaining weight and the fact that you don't look like you're gonna be as healthy as we had hoped, the promotion, we're going to put that off a little while because we're not entirely sure we want to invest the responsibility in someone who's not going to be there and as vital as possible. So in this case, five years ago, if you told me, hey, you better quit smoking or you might not get a job, I would have laughed. But now, five years later, this guy was out of a job and it was held up. Personalized care. It's not just about the population and the health in general but it's about us. So with genomics, proteomics and the like, we now are heading towards a, a, a possibility. And in fact, the entire area around Kendall Square, I like to call this the alley of what's hot and what's not, is now being put around personalized medicine, biologics, and very large heavy molecules. So the possibility of giving you the medication and the device necessary for you to manage your health given your genetic makeup, given your lifestyle and the like is already here. This is not a fantasy going elsewhere. This is also complemented by the much dreamed about electronic health record. So I'm going to be able to manage all your information in one place, and you're going to be able to manage your information in one place to know what you've done, your lifestyles, the medications you've taken, the tests that you've had, so that you are the ultimate informed and rational health care system in your own two feet. So this is what we're promising. This is the system that we believe that is happening out there. And then lastly, monitoring and progress. I want to be able to make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. I'm not just going to give you information to make the right decision. I'm going to try to monitor and, and give you incentives along the way. Does anyone here ever shop at Hannaford's grocery store or any of the stores that have what they call the nutrition guiding stars? So this is not just you know, the idea of maybe giving you a device, but now the grocery stores and retailers have gotten into the space now of actually having an advisory board code the nutritional value of products. So next to the price, it is no longer just making a decision on what it costs, but how many stars does that product have? So if you've got one star, good. Two stars is better. Three is best. So I guess that means the Oreos and brownies probably not, not getting many stars. So now we're going to be, have a platform to be able to make those decisions in real time. And we're going to verify it with maybe, again, the cell phone or the iPod to be able to see what you've bought and to be able to monitor how is your blood pressure in real time? How is your glucose uh, 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 working in real time? Have you been stressed? This phone's already on the market in South Korea. It is uh, already being used in, in Europe as well. Uh, and my much favorite example that some of you may have heard me speak of before um, is the infamous smart toilet that is in Japan and now the UK. How many of you have used a smart toilet? How many of you have been accosted by a smart toilet? <laughs> And I don't mean the Japanese toilet that if you push a few buttons, it, um, shall we say, gives you that special feeling. I'm talking about the smart toilet that's out there that monitors your weight, can download in the computer science sense of the word, your glucose, fiber content, and like. This toilet is the VIP toilet that was piloted in the UK. And it's connected to a retailer uh, in a pilot that allows it to, shall we say, facilitate the home delivery of the food product that apparently um, it's determined that you're lacking. 
So these systems are already out there in Japan and operating. They're now entering the UK. Sure enough, they will be here uh, very soon. Let's go back to the baby. And I'm going to open it up to questions. So we've created a system that we, most of us in this room, would create for any piece of hardware that we want to run efficiently. We want it to be safe. We want it to be cost effective. And what I try to do is to make a case to you saying that, you know, we can work on the margins in healthcare by making the records a little cheaper, by getting the doctors to be a little less expensive, by, you know, shooting all the lawyers. We can make, you know, the OR system, you know, we can make the operation rooms a little faster, and maybe we can reduce the cost of the equipment. And we'd all feel really good about ourselves, and we'd go home, and we'd have our SPSS and Excel sheets and go, look what I saved. And what I want to tell you is that you are the cost. If I can get you to eat right, exercise, and maybe pay attention and keep you out of the system, not only will you be happier, and by the way, for most men as you age, your wife will be a lot happier because she's the one stuck taking care of you, and the oldest adult daughter, that will be a good thing. So here's the question. All the things that I showed you, this emergent system that I would like to call it, is out there. All the things I showed you are already on the market, and it's kind of creating the possibility of gelling this envelope of care around our cute baby. But, and here's the big but. Let me set up a scenario for you. Let me set, out, set up a scenario of a guy named John. I would use Joe, but it gets personal too fast. A guy named John. And John, like Joe, is from Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, we have four basic food groups. We have cheesesteaks, and they have to be from Pat's. This is a very personal issue. And by the way, cheese is not something that is from a cow. Everyone knows that good cheese comes from a jar and is heated up in a microwave. <laughs> this is Cheese Whiz. It includes Scrapple. Does anyone know what Scrapple is? You're probably healthier for it. If it's on a farm and it can't run, grind it up and deep fry it, that is Scrapple. <laughs> Third, tasty cakes. No one knows what they are, but they never go bad. And then lastly, birch beer with ice cream. And it's not beer, it's birch beer. It's kind of like root beer, but a little cheaper. So these are the four basic food groups that John, Joe, had this envelope of care at birth. So here's the scenario. John's parents were neurotic baby boomers. I know it's hard to believe that baby boomers would be neurotic. And before they had John, there was a lot of incentive from the government and from employers to do genetic testing because this health care cost was just getting to be way out of line. We could not afford it personally. We could not afford it publicly. That we had to do something to intervene on the cost of health care. And it was discovered that at least a third of John's maladies in the future probably could be predicted with that, at that point, the state of genetic testing. So they did the testing, and they created a system to help John make the right choice at the right time for the rest of his life to eat the right things, to exercise, and as the technology from this building and everywhere else on campus and around the world emerged, John was given the information to monitor, manage, and indeed motivate the right behaviors. John woke up one day at 62. He was given the technology. He was given the information. He was even given financial incentives along the way, whether it was credit card points, airfares, Promotions on the job, and he still liked his cheesesteaks, his scrapple, his birch beer, and tasty cakes. He is now a type 2 diabetic. He has kidney problems. He has heart problems. My question for you is, a no I have a number of questions for you rather than questions for me, are the following. What do you owe, John? If this system is, in fact, emerging, and we can argue about that in a few moments, does this envelope of care put together a new social contract for people who have the health literacy, the access to the technology, and the knowledge to behave better and well for a lifetime? Is there a penalty for John? He's had all those cheesesteaks, and now somebody's going to have to pay the price. Is there a societal obligation to do better? And by the way, 
part of my argument I'm making here is that the technology is available. Is the genie already out of the bottle? You can make an argument that it's societally, it's not appropriate, that privacy concerns, personal rights, liberty, and everything else, and I would be willing to buy 99.9% .9 of that. But once the technology exists, the opportunity exists to create the system in one piece or in the total that I'm showing you. Privacy versus public cost. Can John just tell us to buzz off? He enjoyed his cheesesteaks, and that's the breaks. Who's going to organize this? I believe that certain systems, you know, social systems can be engineered like government. The political process is an engineered system, but there are certain artifacts that just emerge. We know in software engineering that there are certain artifacts that just happen in the system. What I'm suggesting to you is that all these little things are coming together and putting coming together as a system where we're not sure what the artifact is going to be. Who's going to be the system organizer? Who's going to be the governing body? Is it going to be government? Is it going to be the market? Or is it going to be multiple networks competing for health, wellness, and overall well-being? And by the way, if this is not an emergent system that is coming to be, what do you see out there? So on that note, I'll leave you with the good news. I'll love you with you. You only have 106 years to live. But just stay away from the cheesesteaks, the scrapple, tasty cakes, and birch beer. Thank you very much.